Welcome to a new talk that's part of our Understanding 2 conference at the University of Bucharest. Our speaker tonight is Paulina Sliba from the University of Vienna. I apologize, Paulina, if I'm saying that wrong, please correct me. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to, to finally meet you, even if virtually. Uh, I've read a lot of your work on understanding, so it's, it's fantastic you agreed to give a talk. Uh, Dr. Sliba's talk is titled Moral Inquiry. Paulina, please take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, it would have been nice to have an excuse to go to Bucharest, but Zoom will do fine in the meanwhile. Um, yes, so the talk is on moral inquiry and it, um, it's trying to work out some things that I've been, been thinking for a while that connect to issues around understanding. Um, um, so the talk isn't entirely framed in terms of understanding, but I think it is getting very much at Heart, at issues at the heart of um, understanding the nature of understanding. Okay, so um, the kind of really big question I'm interested in is uh, what is moral inquiry? Um, and I think that's a question where we have to start by thinking about what the subject matter of moral inquiry is, what its aim is, and what its tools are. Um, so those are the kind of very big question um, that I'm trying to make a little bit of progress on. Um, and so um, I think before kind of um, uh, addressing these questions head on, it's going to be helpful to just think about what the standard picture of inquiry is um, that um, is portrayed in the literature. Um, and there, I think there's um, there's a picture that's being kind of that's partly implicit, partly explicit, but it's fairly widely shared. Um, and at first, I actually want to start with just inquiry in general. So I think because I think that's what underlies a lot of the, 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 the what underlies partly the, the, um, the picture of moral inquiry. And that's the kind of standard Lewisian picture um, that you might be familiar with. So here's a quote by Alejandro Perez Carballo, um, who um, summarizes the picture as follows. So following Lewis, we can think of the collection of all possibilities as a logical space. A believer on the Louisian metaphor is a traveler trying to locate herself in logical space, so we can think of an agent's belief state as a particular type of map. Possibilities compatible with what she believes are spread all over it. Her goal is to find the point on the map where she is located. When our agent finds out that P, she rules out all those possibilities in which it is not true that P. She thus comes closer to isolating the point on the map corresponding to the way things are. Okay, so that's a kind of very abstract general picture of inquiry. I think it underpins the way that people think about moral inquiry as well. So what are the possibilities that moral inquiry is concerned with? Because um, that's going to distinguish moral inquiry from just kind of general abstract inquiry. Well, the possibilities that a moral inquiry is concerned with concern the moral status of actions. So the world presents you with the following options telling the truth in a situation may be morally required or it may be merely permissible. Eating meat may be permissible or not. Um, uh, you know, taking an airplane might be permissible or not. Um, so those are the kind of options. Um, and then second, the kind of second possibility set of possibilities is, associ is associated with questions around why the action has the moral status it does. But primarily, moral inquiry aims at um, resolving questions around the moral status of actions and questions around why those actions have the moral status they do. Um, and so that picture, I think, um, we can kind of find explicitly articulated in, um, um, in quite, a, quite a bit of philosophical writing, moral epistemology. So here is um, a paper by Jimmy Lenman. Uh, which has even a moral inquiry in its title. And he says, moral inquiry is an activity in which we all at some level engage. And it's natural to think that some of us, some of the time do it quite well, while others do it less well. And when we do it well, it is natural to think of it as a way of finding things out about how we and others ought and ought not act. So that's exactly what I said. Moral status of actions, that's the kind of... Uh, subject matter of moral inquiry. Here is Peter Singer from his paper, Moral Experts, says, 
The morally good man must try to think out for himself the question of what he ought to do. And presumably the same is true for the woman who must also think out for herself what she ought to do. Um, this thinking out is a difficult to ask, a task. It requires first information. Um, and I may, for instance, be wondering whether it is right to eat meat. So once again, the subject matter of moral inquiry are questions around the moral status of action in that particular example, whether we may eat meat. And um, here is Alison Hills um, from her uh, The Intellectuals and the Virtues paper. She says getting, so she's concerned about the role of moral philosophers in particular and what they, what tools they bring to moral inquiry. And she says, look, getting clear about moral concepts and about what each moral theory or moral principle implies is important and difficult work that should not be underestimated. But that does not exhaust the function of moral philosophy. It is also one of its goals to decide moral questions, to adjudicate between moral theories and moral principles, and to come to ethical conclusions about what to do. So once again, you know, the task of moral philosophy here as well. So basically what she says is, look, moral philosophers should not just be engaged in the in inquiries around how to best articulate moral theories um, and what they imply, but they also need to be, um, they need to get their hands dirty with moral inquiry. They need to consider what, uh, what, what, what the moral status of particular actions is and why. Um, okay, so that just, kind of gives you a flavor. So just to, just to convince you that I'm not, I'm just I'm not just picking a straw man here. Um, and I think, you know, so it, picking a straw man, I mean, I think it's also, it's, it, it's an understandable way to uh, kind of articulate what moral inquiry is. Um, and it's also quite an attractive model, particularly thinking about it in Lusian terms, um, because we can see how moral inquiry may progress. Um, on the one hand, we rule out some possibilities as we find out that they're incompatible with how things really are. Um, so we make progress in this sense and kind of zooming in on where, which logic, which bit of logical space uh, corresponds to the actual world. Um, but on the other hand, it also captures this other aspect of moral inquiry, which is that um, the resolution of our map is typically coarse grained. Um, as our inquiry progresses, we may come to discriminate more finely within possibilities um, and here's one example, you know, perhaps you started out wondering about whether you ought to stop eating meat. Um, and here you are, you do some thinking about it, you want to figure out which, which kind of where you are on the division of logical space. Um, and as you rule out, you might rule out that eating meat is permissible. So now you think it's impermissible. But now you realize like vegetarianism is not the only option, you could also be vegan. Um, and so now you've got a more fine grained distinctions between what possibilities um, between the possibilities that present themselves, you know, ought you be a vegetarian or, or should you be a vegetarian or are you in fact morally required to be a vegan? And so now kind of, once again, you've made a finer distinction and you're kind of homing in more and more on the point where, where you are located in logical space. And Paris Carballo in particular argues that learning how to make uh, that kind of conceptual innovation um, is a matter of learning how to make additional distinctions. So he says, on this way of thinking, acquiring new conceptual resources can be identified with being able to make new distinctions among possibilities. And we can think of the distinctions as an agent is able to make as the propositions she's able to entertain. So again, as we finesse our conceptual resources, whether by acquiring new concepts or by becoming more adept at using the ones that we already have, we kind of learn to discriminate more finely amongst ways the world might be, morally speaking, um, and thus we can locate ourselves in logical space within greater precision. And in particular, we learn to discriminate more finely amongst the kind of various actions that are available to us and the moral status they might have. And we kind of home in on, on what, you know, we become better and better at telling of um, how we ought to live our lives. Okay, so, um, you know, I think this is a fine picture to have. It's not like there's something like uh, terribly, terribly, wrong about like it's not just like it's completely wrong like clearly it accounts for a large part of our moral inquiry because sometimes we do engage in these questions and that's how we try to kind of make progress on them um, but i think it doesn't tell the whole story and i think it's in particular i think it's just too narrow here is a kind of one way of getting at how it's too narrow um, it starts in the middle 
So it already takes for granted that there are certain possibilities that we distinguish between. And then, um, and then it kind of starts with trying us, like moral inquiry then uh, result, it consists in trying to um, uh, locate ourselves amongst these possibilities. Um, but as Jane Friedman observes, you know, if we want to move ourselves from a state of ignorance to a state of knowing by inquiring, then at least two things need to happen. A question needs to be opened or asked, and then it needs to be closed in the right sort of way or answered. So you can see that the standard picture, it's kind of very concerned with the answering bit, but it doesn't tell you very much about where the asking bit comes from or like how those, where those questions, where those questions come from and how they're opened. So it kind of, it doesn't really, um, like it doesn't, it kind of starts, it starts in the middle of the story as opposed to the beginning. Um, and that's because the opening of a question can be as much part of the inquiry as the steps it takes to close. Um, and an inquiry can go wrong, not just because we get stuck on the answering part, but because we go, or we, we kind of, we go um, uh, astray on the, on, the, on the asking bit. Um, and the standard account just kind of takes the questions being asked for granted. Um, so I think that's, a, um, that's one problem. But I think the other issue is that we just don't look for answers to questions about what the right thing to do is and why. Um, that's not, that does not exhaust the kind of moral inquiry that we engage in. Um, moral inquiry can be engaged in um, something, something more global and uh, something slightly harder to pin down um, which I, I want to call making sense of a situation. Um, and I'll give you an example um, that I've been thinking about quite a while. Um, I won't read out all of, all, all of it, but I'll read, read out the relevant bits. And it's about, uh, it's about sexual assault, just as a warning. Um, okay, so here's an example. Um, when Kristen was raped a few years later, it took her a while to use that word. Um, he took advantage of me is what Kristen said at first. When that didn't feel right, she said, he's an asshole. But that didn't seem right either. She had no word to summarize the experience. And here's what happened. She was at her friend's house for a party. It was late, people were going to sleep and she climbed up to the top of a bunk bed to get away from an older guy who was creeping her out. Kristen was drunk. She remembers her face felt numb. She remembers hearing someone banging on the door which she later found out he had locked before he climbed up into the bunk bed and took her clothes off. She said no, but he had sex with her anyway. Um, sex, that didn't feel like the right word either. Um, and then she noticed that her friends um, doing the same thing, describing their experience with boys in different tones and different arrangements. And then um, her friend has a particularly upsetting experience. And it's at that moment where kind of the penny drops for Kristen. And here's what she says. She says, all those times when we were mad at those boys because of what they did to us, we were mad because they raped us, you know? And there was like several of my friends where it took us a really long time to put the word to it. So this is an example from, taken from an episode of This American Life. Um, it's called, the episode is called Five Women. Um, it's an excellent episode. Um, okay, so what, I, well, what is Kristen doing? I mean, I think, I think Kristen is engaging in moral inquiry. Like she is trying to understand her situation. She's trying to make sense of what happened to her. And it's not like she's, she's not just interested. It's, it's not just like a linguistic exercise she's interested in. She's not just trying to wondering what name to put her to her experience, even though like that's the gloss the reporter put on it. I don't think that's what's actually going on. What she's trying to do is she's trying to make sense of what happened to her. She's trying to figure out how to think about it. And that's, I think, that's a kind of a really important part of moral inquiry, um, but it's not one that easily fits within the paradigm um, of the standard picture. And it doesn't fit easily within the paradigm because there is no obvious question that Kristen is asking, you know, is this right or this is wrong? She's just like, it's just like stuff happened and she's trying to make sense of it. That's the first gloss technical description that I have of the issue. Um, and so the central question um, that, 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 that is, I think that we need to figure out is, 
what exactly it is this like making sense of something in that situation like what what is it what what does that involve okay and i think the first uh thing that it's going to be helpful in order to make progress on that question is to slightly step back leave the example aside for a second and think about um, the subject matter of morality and the kind of things we might be wondering about um, when we're kind of navigating moral questions. Um, because I think we need, we need a richer description here than, um, than, what, than the tools that the standard picture is using, which is just around kind of moral status of actions. Um, and then maybe once we have this kind of richer conception, uh, we can go back to Kristen and see whether that helps us resolve um, our puzzlement as to what exactly she's, she's trying to achieve when she's trying to make sense of what happened to her. And so I want to introduce this notion of a moral landscape. Um, and I'm just gonna take a sip of tea. Okay. Okay, so because the thing, so what if moral inquiry isn't just about settling whether and why actions are right or wrong, then what is it about? Okay, so here is what I think, um, we need to think about and it's not so this is like i think I, I think i'm articulating something that's really obvious but i think it's still helpful to have it articulated um because it's easy to kind of lose sight of it okay so here is here is i think our predicament we are all of us are embedded in this intricate web of duties and rights and permissions and expectations that connect us to one another it's like a matrix and um, this moral web basically forms the fabrics of our relationships. So, you know, what constitutes a friend is precisely this kind of signature of normative relations, including duties, rights, and expectations um, that exist between us, um, and the exact shape of which depends on the kind of history and context and closeness of the friendship. Um, and um, these kind of duties and rights and expectations and kind of normative relations, they concern not just actions, but they also concern feelings and attitudes. So again, as an example for friendship, you know, when you're friends with someone, it's not just that you owe them to act in a certain way, but you also owe them trust, you owe them goodwill. Um, they are kind of entitled to sympathy when things go badly for them. They are entitled to us feeling resentful when their boyfriend treats them badly, um, resentful of the boyfriend that is. Um, so there's it's these kind of relations, they, they're just much, they govern much, much more than simply what kind of what we ought to do in each situation. Um, and this web of moral relations is really complicated. Um, and that's in part because, you know, our relationships overlap and so the kind of normative, the, the, the rights and duties and permissions can also be multiply overlapping. And in fact, sometimes they can be conflicting. Um, you know, sometimes we're friends with our colleagues. Um, we are colleagues with our partners sometimes. Um, and kind of each of these relationships has its own set of expectations and, and duties, and they're kind of meshed together in this complicated way. Um, so it's complex. And then the other thing that's really important, I think, is that it's dynamic. It changes constantly. And sometimes it changes because just stuff around us changes. So, you know, someone might die, um, someone might be born, um, like an accident might happen. And in that case, that's going to impinge on the kind of uh, things that we owe and may expect of one another. Um, but in other cases, it's we who change it. And we change it, we can change it intentionally um, by exercising certain normative powers. Um, these are like, you know, by making promises, by giving consent, by forgiving someone. In that case, what I'm doing, I mean, one way, you know, th this way of thinking about these activities as normative powers is to think of them as kind of active interventions in the moral landscape. Like by making a promise, I create an obligation and a right that just wasn't there before. Um, and the activity, its aim is to do that. Um, so there's just, there are these instances where the moral landscape changes because we are actively reshaping it. And then sometimes it changes because we, um, un we, we unintentionally do something that results in big shifts. And one important intervention um, that I've kind of articulated in other work 
um, an important intervention in the normative land, in the moral landscape is wrongdoing. So sometimes um, the moral landscape can change quite dramatically um, because we have um, because we have uh, violated someone's right or or um, stepped on someone's cons overstepped someone's consent or wronged them in some other way. By wronging someone, you again create new obligations and rights where there were none before, including obligations to apologize, to explain, to make amends, duties to acknowledge the wrong and be responsive to the upset and hurt of the wrong one, the duty to engage in emotional labor, in other words. Um, right, so this is just kind of to keep in mind, to remind us that there is more to ethics than just questions around whether to become a vegetarian, um, that it's kind of, um, they're just these complicated moral relations that we stand in and that we have to navigate. And that brings us back to questions around epistemology. Okay, and it brings us back because it's really important for us to keep track of the moral landscape. So to keep track roughly of the kind of moral relations, duties, rights, expectations that are in play in various situations that we're in. Um, so we need to know the kind of contours of the moral landscape. And we need to know them, not just because it bears on what we ought to do in certain situations, but also because it's crucial to kind of understand the nature of the relationships that we're in. Um, so it's really kind of important to make sense of our place, you know, within our, within the social fabric. And so that I think gives us a first, like fairly abstract characterization of moral inquiry, what, what it might include over and above simply moral status of actions. And that's that it aims to provide us with an accurate map of the moral landscape. So moral inquiry aims to navigate, help us navigate the moral landscape. And as I just said, this can be really tricky. Uh, and it can be tricky because sometimes we find um, ourselves in situations where um, we, we might have a sense that the moral landscape around us has shifted or changed in some really profound way, but we don't quite know how it has changed. Um, so, and I think that's kind of the situation that Kristen is in. Like she can sense that there has been like a profound shift, but she's not clear on what the shift exactly means, what it consists in. And in that situation, you know, in situations like that, um, you can be faced with like a lot of really messy details. Some of it can be very upsetting. Um, you can have conflicting feeling and you somehow need to sort out through all that stuff and figure out which of the many details matter and how they matter. Um, so that's, and that's what kind of moral inquiry is about. It needs to, it, it, it aims to kind of help you resolve that and arrive at some kind of coherent, coherent picture of coherent map of your moral situation. Okay, so then, um, the question, which brings us to the question, okay, how does that work? So what are the tools for moral inquiry? And this is the section that I am really, uh, I'm just like working through stuff. So um, this is very much in progress and it needs a lot more thought. So I'm, I'm very welcome, I welcome feedback. Okay, so, um, okay, so one navigational tool, which I think already we can just, import from the standard picture is um, our kind of concept concepts and the kind of distinctions we can draw. So concepts allow us to discriminate between different ways the world might be. Um, you know, and you know, those will be typically typically coarse grained in our case. And we might think that that's um, that that's what Kristen is doing. Like she's trying, what she's trying to do is she's kind of trying out different ways of conceptualizing um, her experience in terms of being taken advantage of and team in terms of dealing with an asshole um, before she settles on the concept of rape. Um, but I think that's, I mean, so there is, there is something right about that, but I think it doesn't tell you the whole story. And I think, it doesn't tell you the whole story because there's more like what Kristen is looking for is more than just a way to draw distinctions between different possibilities. One way of seeing it is that she rejects these various possibilities to conceptualize her situation. So she rejects the, the possibility of thinking of it in terms of um, 
uh, being taken advantage of. Um, and she rejects the way of thinking about it as uh, like dealing with an asshole. Um, but in some sense, like that's, if you think that the only thing that she's trying to do is she's kind of trying to distinguish between different ways the world might be and kind of locating herself correctly. That's weird because like those, those are like apt descriptions of what happened. Like she was taken advantage of, like the guy was an asshole. Right, so she's if she's like if she's just kind of trying to figure out how to distinguish between different possibilities and where she's lo located amongst those possibilities, like those are perfectly fine ways of distinguishing possibilities. And she's like, and, and she's very much placing herself correct, like in the correct part of the grid. If she's if she's if she thinks she was taken advantage of or the guy was an asshole. So, you know, whatever um, whatever she's. Seems to me like whatever she's trying to do is is more than just um, kind of uh, trying to discriminate between different words of find, different ways the world might be, and she's trying more to just kind of accurately and fine grainedly discriminating between the different world, ways the world might be and figuring and placing herself within it. She's something. She's trying to do something more. Okay, so what more is she trying to do? Well, she's trying to somehow figure out how things fit together in the moral situation. So she's trying to figure out, um, you know, what kinds of rights and obligations, permissions are in play. How have those changed? Are they form a pattern? What explains the pattern? How is it similar to other situations? Um, which features of the situation are explanatorily relevant? Which ones should she pay attention to, and which ones should she simply ignore? Okay, so if so, I think we need something more than just if we're going to think about moral inquiry. Um, and explaining what happens in those cases, we're going to have to reach for a different kind of set of tools than just, um, than just concepts. And the thing that I'm interested in, the possibility that I'm interested in exploring is the possibility of making use of perspectives um, as they are introduced by Liz Camp and her work. So here is what a perspective is. A perspective is is, it's a stable cognitive disposition. In fact, it's a set of dispositions. And it's a disposition to, um, amongst other things, to employ particular intuitive structures to a subject matter. So as Liz Cam puts it, perspectives are open-ended dispositions to interpret and specifically to produce intuitive structures of thought about or characterizations of particular subjects. So what is that? What is an intuitive structure? Well, an intuitive structure is like a set of associations um, that um, we might bring to bear on a situation. And they're not, um, they're kind of things that might come to mind and that might strike you. And they're things that also um, single out features of the situation as particularly salient and explanatorily relevant um, and, uh, you know, and, and have other kind of retreat in the background. So, um, you know, for example, um, uh, hold on. Well, actually, no, sorry. I'll give you that example in a second. Okay. So um, what happens then when you, when you take up a perspective is that you, impo you, you, you impose a certain order on a situation. So the perspective will constrain what you notice, will constrain what you attend to. It will highlight certain information as significant, and it will also provide you with a taxonomy and a kind of background setting of like things, background beliefs, associations, memories. And those will kind of allow you to integrate and interpret new experience into a coherent whole. Um, so again, Camp explains a perspective involves the disposition to use intuitive patterns of thought, which guide what an agent just does naturally notice what explanatory connections they do tend to form and how they immediately respond in cognition and action. So, you know, so those intuitive patterns of thought, I mean, one example of such an intuitive pattern of thought is a stereotype. So a stereotype is just like a collection of features kind of basically ordered by salience that come to mind when you think about a certain situation. Um, and it's not like um, those are, you know, inf it's not like one of them actually logically entails one another. It's just like the structured stuff that comes to mind when you think about, um, when you think about something in terms of a stereotype. Um, one question that arises um, 
is what the relationship is between concepts and perspectives. So I've said both, you know, the way I understand concepts is also dispositionally. So I understand concepts in terms of making certain distinctions amongst possibilities. Um, so I think the way I'm thinking about a perspective is um, as something as, uh, as including that disposition. So a concept, uh, a perspective, well, because it imposes a taxonomy, part of what you're going to do when, you're, when you take up a perspective to something, you're going to be disposed to use certain concepts um, to, to, to kind of to, to bring to bear on the situation. But I think a perspective involves more than just the disposition, uh, than just involves more than just conceptual thought. So it involves more than just discriminating between possibilities, because it also comes with these kind of intuitive associations, where kind of things remind you of it, you, certain things come to mind, certain things strike your attention. Um, and I think that just goes over and beyond um, the kind of uh, cognitive um, work that concepts typically are taken to do. But that's, that's very much the bit that needs to be articulated um, more clearly, I think, in the, in the picture. Um, okay, so let me just, to conclude, um, let me just bring out um, how then I think this uh, applies, how this helps with thinking about what's going on in Kristen's case. So I think what Kristen is trying to do is she is grasping for a perspective on her situation. And she's looking for an interpretive key that would allow her to integrate the morally significant details and the moral consequences into a whole that kind of makes sense, that coheres explanatorily. And so, um, you might think, oh, well, but she's like, she's, what, what is she doing? I mean, isn't she just trying to conceptualize it in certain ways? And here's what I want to say is like, yes, I think she is using those um, action terms and trying them on if they fit. Um, but the reason, but that's compatible with what I'm saying, in fact, that supports what I'm saying, because um, these thick action verbs, like dealing with an asshole or rape or being taken advantage of, what they do is, in fact, they express perspectives. So they are what this camp calls framing devices, a kind of representational vehicles which express perspectives. Um, and we can kind of see that when we like. I do want to think through the details. So think about um, the, the 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 expression being an asshole. So like the perspective expressed by such by the framing device being an asshole. I mean, basically, what that gives you it's like a map that. Uh, uh, like it suggests a map to navigate the moral situation. It selectively highlights certain features and certain moral norms governing the situation and places them kind of at the center of the explanatory and morally significant relations. So here is, I think it works when you, when you think about being an asshole, what you make salient, what you foreground are norms of respect and norms of kindness that govern interpersonal relations. And so when that's the perspective you take on the situation experienced by, by Kristen, you kind of place the incident, the incident as, um, as being kind of an affront on those kinds of norms. You see, those are the norms that matter to kind of understanding what happened. That was the, the, the thing that violated, as you suggest that those were the norms that were violated by that incident. Um, and similarly, when you describe the situation as you know, dealing with an asshole, what you evoke is you evoke like a whole range of situation of associations that you have in the background. I mean, you can like Google image search being an asshole and you kind of get the, get the idea. I mean, it's like lots of like slick businessmen like yelling at secretaries or I don't know, SUV drivers like rolling their window down to be like to, to, to yell at bicycle at cyclists for daring to share the road with them. Um, you kind of like see like the kind of the things, the situation that come in mind are just like lots of red faced, angry guys yelling abuse, losing their tempers, being condescending, being bullying, being unkind. Um, you, can, you can think of character traits like narcissism or selfishness. And you kind of have the whole range paradigm examples of people being an asshole. I mean, I'm sure you've got your favorite ones. So. Uh, and then, you know, I think you also kind of render salient, you make salient certain emotional responses that are being associated with someone being an asshole, like feelings of astonishment um, and humiliation. And so you can kind of see why Kristen wasn't happy with that 
So, you know, it wasn't that the guy wasn't an asshole because he was, but the guy, the, the thing is that the kind of the map that, the, that this framing device gave her of her situation just wasn't a good fit. Like, um, she didn't like placing the, the thing as placing the incident as an affront to interpersonal norms of respect and kindness just doesn't really seem to um, kind of uh, get right the kind of norms that we're violating in that play. So it doesn't, you know, she might, because she, and it might not be a good fit for making sense of how she feels about it because she doesn't feel humiliated. I mean, maybe she feels violated and upset. Um, so it's kind of, the kind of richer thing gives you this map and the map just doesn't turn out to be a particular fit because you look around and the kind of landmarks don't really line up, you know, to kind of uh, be in this, in this state, in the metaphor. Um, okay, and so that, uh, I mean, to end, I guess, I'll give you a, like a really lovely quote by Cheshire Calhoun, which I think, um, which I think gets really, I'm always, I, I, I really like her work. Um, uh, but I think, I think it gets something really right. Um, so she says, in thinking about our own moral experience, whether we do this in philosophic theories or sermons in solitary reflection or gossip, we stylize our experience. Each of us stretches the moral experiences occurring in our lives on a common fra frame of concepts, agency, personal responsibility, images, and stock of examples. Um, and then she says, you know, that those patterns of moral thinking stylize moral experience by determining what we notice or overlook, remember or forget, or take as an important or trivial about our moral life. And so what I want to suggest um, is that we should be thinking of perspectives as doing that stylizing. Um, and that, that stylizing is really important because it provides us with the kind of, it's, it gives us this basic navigational tool um, to kind of orient ourselves within within the moral landscape and the moral relations we stand in. And just kind of to sum up, um, I think uh, this provides us with, well, not so much with an alternative, um, but with a supplement to the, to the standard picture. So on the standard picture, you know, moral inquiry kind of consists in answering moral questions around what to do and why to do it. Um, but then that's, that's just a tiny part of our moral inquiry. There's this wider range where we don't look for a moral verdict, but we try to make sense of our moral experience. And I suggest that in that case, we're not looking for, for an answer, at least not to an answer to a WH question, to a what or why question. What we're looking for, if anything, is an answer to a how question. Question, how do I understand this experience? How do I think about it? And that answer is provided um, by this perspective. Um, and the perspective is not a proposition, it's not an answer to a question, but rather it's a tool for thinking about the situation, a tool that organizes your experience. And I've suggested that it's a map for navigating a part of a moral landscape. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you know, it's not like these two pictures are completely, uh, I mean, the, you know, it's not like what I've said is completely irrelevant for the standard picture. Because once you take up a perspective, certain questions arise, certain lines of inquiry um, become salient as worth pursuing. So then um, perspective kind of suggests certain lines of inquiry. Um, and in that sense, at least, moral inquiry does not always aim at, at, at answers. Um, sometimes it's trying to just get the questions right. Okay, thank you. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Paulina. This has been uh, absolutely fantastic. And please join me in thanking Dr. Sliva for her talk. And uh, if you'd like to ask a question or you may uh, use your virtual hand button or you may signal that in chat. And I already see a question from uh, Chris. Chris, please go ahead. Thanks, Paulina. That was really interesting. Good to see you as well. Very nice talk. <laughs> Um, uh, so um, my question is about, well, understanding um, the aim of inquiry and uh, how that relates to, to your view. Um, so, so here's something that I find plausible and I think many people find plausible. You know, you can distinguish between trying to like, you know, inquire into specific questions, right? Whether there's a table here or why there's a table here. Right, and then you can 
inquire into more general phenomena like the rise of the Roman Empire or something like that, right? And now it seems to me that the, the second case, the general phenomena, right? I mean, that's, it seems very plausible to me that what that aims at constitutively, uh, that inquiry is understanding, right? When I'm inquiring into the rise of the Roman Empire, what I'm trying to do is understand it. And if that's not like, you know, what, what I'm doing, then I'm not inquiring. Okay, so, so if that's right, um, then you like, you know, I mean, what inquiry aims at will like, you know, depend in part or be constrained by what your view of inquiry is and like, uh, sorry, of understanding is. And I think we're both kind of roughly in the same boat here, right? Um, um, which is, it's a, a question of knowing a bunch of stuff about that thing, right? Now I'm, I'm wondering why not just like, you know, throw this kind of view at the phenomenon, right? What, what, what Kristen is trying to, to do is, is understand the events of that night, right? And like, you know, I mean, as she knows more about it, right? Um, um, she understands it better, right? And, and the reason why she remains unsatisfied with, uh, uh, you know, certain ways of describing it is that like, you know, maybe she comes to know a bunch of stuff, but she wants to like, you know, it's not quite enough. She wants to understand it better, right? Um, now, one thing, and, and I think this is the, the, the real question that I have. Um, if, if you think of things in this way, right, then I wonder whether you, you really need this whole talk of, of perspectives um, and um, also whether the sort of this idea of, under, or, or of moral inquiry having to do with a map or aiming at, at a map is really the, the right way of thinking about it because basically if I'm right about inquiry and understanding, right, and understanding being a, a matter of knowledge, then it looks as though the kind of representations that we're interested in when, um, when inquiring are propositional, whereas maps don't seem to be propositional representations, right? So maybe the, the map is not really the right kind of you know, model for, uh, for what we're trying to do uh, uh, when we're inquiring. So the, 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 that was my, my... Yeah, no, that's really good. <laughs> and it's kind of pushes on the point, which is something that, you know, I'm, um, uh, I have in the back, I've kind of, uh, I, 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 there is this worry about contradicting <laughs> earlier held beliefs. <laughs> um, but I, I guess, so part of what makes me resistant to just say she's looking for more knowledge is that it doesn't seem to me quite to get the phenomenology right, I think. So I like, I mean, I obviously I'm all for um, reducing um, understanding into to knowledge, but there's, in that case, there's something um, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't seem to me quite enough because she's not just looking for, um, uh, it just seems like there's something, she's not just looking for like particular answers. She's like trying to figure out how to feel about the situation at the same time. Um, and that just doesn't seem to me, does, just doesn't seem to me to do justice to the phenomenology. So now the thing that I'm wondering, which is which is um, how to kind of um, uh, bridge a gap between this and the views that I have defended elsewhere. So I guess I, t I, I tend to think of understanding as coming in two different, like I think we need to distinguish between two, two different types of understanding, right? One is, one is um, understanding what and why and, and where and so on. And that I think just reduces to propositional knowledge and knowing enough of it. And then I was thinking that understanding of a subject domain that I've, I've said that's kind of the, that's a matter of the having the ability to to know stuff about that domain. And then I wonder whether that actually fits with with the picture defended here, because the idea is, I mean, in part, I think the idea is that a perspective is a tool a cognitive tool which allows you to have a bunch of knowledge and allows you to have certain propositional knowledge about that as well right like once you take the perspective that what happened was rape there's like a whole bunch of propositional knowledge um, that you can have about that situation um, um, but it's not just not reducible to to that to like a, to kind of a set of propositions 
Um, so I think that's how I, so that's how I would try to kind of um, make it consistent. So like, I, I agree that there's something right. I would just, I, I, th I think there's, I just think that there's not, that, that that's not the whole story, it strikes me. All right, thank you so much, Chris, for the question, Paulina, for answering. Next up, we have a question from Dan Zeman. Dan, please go ahead. Uh, yes, hi, thanks. Thanks so much for the talk. I found it really interesting. I have to apologize in advance. My computer makes some weird noises, so hopefully that's not gonna interfere with uh, my question. So I also have a question about uh, squaring the, the kind of framework that you sketched with uh, maybe you know previous conceptual tools. And I'm wondering whether what the cases that you're saying with involving Kristen can be somehow described as uh, involving notion of um, uh, you know, conceptual injustice or uh, in terms of Catherine Jenkins notion of uh, hermeneutical injustice, right? So what happens in this case, it seems to be maybe not so much the injustice part, but it's still the case that uh, Kristen in this scenario, uh, not that she lacks the concept of rape, but she fails to apply the concept of rape to the particular case, to the particular experience that she has, um, has, uh, has been subjected to. So my question is, I mean, is, wouldn't that give you some, at least something of what you're after? Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe, maybe your point is that you need this kind of, this notion of perspectives precisely because it gives you this understanding of, or it gives you this opportunity to apply this concept to this particular case, to the particular experience that the, that you, that the Christian underwent. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense. I hope it does. Yeah, no, it does. I mean, part okay. of the question here is how does it connect? So it's, I think it's Miranda Fricker who's, uh, who, um, who coined the term hermeneutical injustice. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're right. I think, I mean, I think this is very much kind of what I was, I was thinking, I was thinking for, but I think actually this hermeneutical injustice, it's not an alternative to thinking to the kind of proposal I have here. In fact, I think that this kind of uh, thinking about in terms of perspectives is what in fact gives you an account of hermeneutical injustice in the end. I mean, so, you know, the question is kind of what, you know, because it's, so the example is like is similar to the, the one Fricker uses about Carmita Woods. In, Car in Carmita Woods, it's 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 the matter of sexual harassment, and um, and then the idea is that uh, she's she's suffering hermeneutical injustice because she doesn't have the right conceptual tools to to describe her experience, and therefore she cannot communicate what happened to her to others. Okay, so I think that there's just. Uh, this like I just think that doesn't really do justice to what is going on in that case. I mean, so first of all, like it's not it's not like there's a name miss. It's not like Carmita. It seems to take for granted basically that Carmita Woods has like a really clear idea of what actually happened to her and what mattered. The problem is she doesn't have a name, a term that she can associate with it, with which she can make it understandable to others. And I think that just misdescribes um, uh, that that just misdescribes the the epistemic predicament in which she finds herself and in which um, I think Kristen finds herself but the predicament is that like part of what you don't know is exactly what happened and part of the reason why you don't know what happened is because you don't know which of the details matter um, of of the kind of experience that you have and how to kind of put them together um, and I think just like thinking of terms of putting a term to the experience just doesn't, it doesn't fail, fails to account for the fact that like part of what you're puzzled about is precisely what the experience is. And so I think the kind of the, the idea of perspectives gives you a nice way of cashing out um, what exactly it is that's missing in that case um, and why uh, it brings with it this kind of confusion of uh, kind of even understanding kind of the boundaries and the ground rules of what happened. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dan and uh, Paulina, for answering. Um, I'm very glad Dan uh, asked that because I had a question along similar lines. And so I'm going to tackle maybe a slightly different uh, uh, thing. So, um, uh, first of all, thanks for your talk. I mean, this was very powerful. And um, I'm uh, uh, thinking about some some phrases you used, right? You said it seemed to Kristen as though 
um, even though conceptually speaking, uh, the guy in question was an asshole, even though conceptually she had been taken advantage of. So even though all that's right, it, it doesn't seem to be the best fit, right? It doesn't seem to be. So uh, in a sense, a, sh a shift in perspectives would, would uh, help her uh, uh, sort of understand the situation uh, that she had gone through in, um, um, in a deeper way. Right. And so I was wondering, um, since since you mentioned this idea of fit, I was wondering what you think about this uh, two or three step strategy that that used to be um, in vogue in the '80s. I think with with Michael Slody, with uh, Martha Nussbaum, with Barbara Herman, the Kant scholar. Mm -hmm. So uh, this idea that uh, first off there is a kind of appreciation of of a moral situation in terms of uh, which features of it, which which of its moral features are perceptually salient, sort of come uh, sort of jump to eye, right? And that, in some sense, causally prompts us to have some emotions about it. And then, in a ways, uh, we um, seek a conceptualization of the situation in question that fits our emotions, or something like that. But the point isn't simply to simply. Um, capture our emotional life, but the point is to, to figure out why we have the emotions in question, if, they're, if emotions are like radars for the right values or something like that. So um, there, there are kind of maybe two or three steps to that in this, in this older strategy. And it seemed to me that in the newer work you're referring to with Elizabeth Camp and, and your own contribution and so on, there, perspectives seem to play an analogous role in some sense to this kind of, well, um, how is it that we um, get um, the most, the, the concepts that best explain the situation, even though they all apply, only some of them are best explainers, right? And um, it seemed as though part of what's at issue here is that there's a kind of double fit between concepts and emotions on the one hand and concepts and the situation in question on the other hand. And so I wonder if, um, I realize that's quite a dated project uh, uh, from, from Slody, Nussbaum, Herman and others, but I wonder if there's any kind of parallel to, to the project that you're engaged in now. Thanks. Yeah, good, that's a good question. Um, I know that earlier projects are less well than I ought, than I ought to, um, but I think, I would be resistant. I think a lot of it aims at this idea that somehow emotions are the detectors of value, right? They're like, it's this emotions first, <laughs> if you want moral epistemology. And I'm quite suspicious of that. I don't, I wouldn't want to endorse that. Um, I mean, I think emotions are in there, but I think it kind of goes both ways. So I think, um, you know, sometimes um, you might, reject a perspective because it doesn't fit how you feel about the situation. And you might be entirely right. Um, like that, the fact that there's a mismatch indicates that there is some, that there is something, that there are questions to be asked, questions of fit, but the fit could go either way. Like it could be that the right way to resolve that conflict is for you to change how you feel about it. And in fact, adopting a perspective can be a way of changing how you feel about a situation. Um, so I think that's, um, uh, it's not, there's no kind of epistemic privilege um, that's attached to emotion. Emotions are kind of in there um, and they're, everything is, everything is up for question in the same way. And it's like this perspective, you know, people say like, I think we also like need to be a little bit suspicious sometimes in like how these stories, I think particularly like in the feminist literature, gets told when we're like the Hermita Wood, the Kermita Wood case or even that case as it's being reported where like you know all of the sudden the penny drops as you get the right description and just everything falls into place and resolves and there's this perfect fit like I think there's a bit of a myth to that like nothing nothing really fits perfectly you know and um and kind of adopting endorsing the perspective if you think that is the right perspective to take like there might still be work in kind of uh, like realizing that like, oh, maybe maybe like you still feel like you're to blame for the situation. Like maybe Kristen still feels like she's to blame and then she can kind of, but she can kind of then step back from this feelings and say, no, 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 it's not my fault. You know, 
I was right. The guy was the one who's, who's to blame. So it's like, it kind of, it, it, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't um, be seduced by these stories of just everything resolving. Um, there's always, there's always muddling through in, in, in real life. Uh, quite a powerful conclusion. Uh, uh, I think that's that seems to be um, um, that seems to be um, quite quite important. I'm uh, I'm wondering uh, just to come back to something Dan said earlier in your reply to to his question, right? So about hermeneutic injustice, it seems as though um, uh, this might be just speculating uh, because of the uh, just the bit of the transcript that 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 we saw, and I don't know anything else about the uh, Kirsten scenario. But um, it seems as though um, um, sort of being um, in direct contact with uh, people who are um, who testify to having been in similar situations. Um, in some sense, makes the evidence accrue that the cases in question are similar to some extent. And so that um, um, puts, um, uh, puts an evidential burden, both on Kirsten and on her friends, to in some sense, not just uh, try to make sense of their in, uh, specific situations, each, each her own, but try to um, uh, grapple with with the phenomenon uh, jointly in conversation as friends and so on, and 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 this seems again to to remind me of this uh, hermeneutic injustice um, uh, uh, idea that Fricker has because it, in some sense they're trying to scaffold their common experience, right? And so it's no longer the issue of just her trying to understand what happened to her in a unique moment in remote past, but the kind of ongoing um, uh, oppression and injustice that her friends are experiencing as well. And so I wonder if um, that kind of added sort of conceptual layer to um, this kind of uh, asymmetric oppression um, sort of blends into which perspectives become more salient and as times goes by and sort of things clarify. Maybe, maybe there is no penny that drops, but maybe there's a kind of a sense to why things clarify after seeing so many other cases that are similar. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, um, um, I mean, part of what it allows you to do is uh, it kind of, it allows you to kind of you know, certain features repeat themselves. So like part of what you see is a pattern. I guess that's what, what, you, what you get as kind of experiences accumulate is that you can discern a pattern. Um, and that pattern allows you to kind of isolate the features that matter. Um, and then you can kind of start, you know, building, <laughs> building, uh, Kind of a map around those around those features and say okay well how do those features matter and why do they matter and why are they connected in this way um, so that can be i think that can be really helpful that's how i think new perspectives can get built right but i think i think it's important it's important to me that the phenomenon is more slightly you know the, the, this this is a phenomenon that happens in the cases of hermeneutical injustice but this kind of phenomenon of making sense of a situation in terms of a perspective and switching perspectives, you know, that's much, much wider than just um, in cases of hermeneutical injustice. And it's also why, like, um, and it also doesn't, I mean, it's also important that kind of multiple perspectives can be correct. It's not like, um, it's not like there's a unique perspective that's apt for many situations, right? I mean, you can see you can see a conflict as a workplace quarrel, or you can see a conflict as a clash of personalities, um, or you can see a conflict as a institutional dysfunction because like two, uh, policies and workloads are unmanageable. These are like all three perspectives to take on a situation, and each of them might be right. Um, which ones is going? Which one is going to be the, mo the the right one to take in that context, in the, in a particular situation, in a particular context, to make sense of what happened? 
that that is a really interesting question that I want to think about more. Um, but it's not but it's not like you know it's it's going to be partly determined by um, prudential and also moral considerations, right? But it's not purely um, it's not just a matter of simple accuracy. Uh, thank you so much. I think that's exactly right, and and very much looking forward to. to um, um seeing um seeing see, seeing where this leads i'm very interested in this notion of perspective so uh i'm gonna i'm gonna try to bug you a bit more about it but uh for now thank you so much please join me once again in in uh, thanking dr sleeva for her talk thank you andre for having me um and thank you all for your excellent questions and i too am very interested to see where this goes <laughs> All right, fantastic. Um, what I suggest is, um, uh, because I see the next speaker is already with us, and that's me. Uh, what I suggest is we take two minutes break, okay, and come back afterwards. Okay, thanks. <laughs>